mainly after my three month stay I was told that I didn't actually have to stay for the six months that I was charged with by the courtesan Amy, whose last name at the present moment escapes me, but she used to be in court eight, now she's moved to another court, I think 39, uh, Amy Jones was the woman's name. She immediately and every time patronized me and completely insulted me with regard to not only the Constitution and the federal laws that she was abating, but also the Human Rights Declaration, which she didn't give a shit about, according to her. She said so pretty profoundly in the transcript. But what I can tell you is that I just sat there and listened to her and marveled at how she totally would contradict herself in a sentence. It just made me laugh. Because I knew I was going to have to deal with this shit anyway, but I was just absolutely point at least as punch that she'll probably go in and have her little cronies fuck the transcript in which she totally absolutely contradicted herself and contradicted the law she was spewing and i hope to god that somebody like oprah picked that shit up when i told them about it now in life we have moments of time to speak the truth and this morning i took some videos of someone and yesterday i took some videos of someone but isn't it interesting that those videos of those two gay men who work at the staple shop got totally deleted and is it also interesting, after I laid myself down in a space after eating my lunch just to give myself some grounding, because I have not been feeling terribly well, usually based on the fact that I'm not able to find the foods that my body and cellular health needs, is that, on a modest budget, is that, in truth, a gentleman walked up to me who was bald and was obviously a Fisher's policeman who had come into the community, because he sure looked like one, and that's from crossing the state line, I'm crossing a federal line, and basically played at me like he wanted to apologize for wanting to step over me. And I think that was just so he could get a look at me, so he could play around with my cards, or do something while I was sleeping, and I just had picked up a, uh, some of my iced tea, uh, peach tree tea that I kind of taint up and get a better flavor for me with, and, um, with some flavor packets, and, uh, I simply said to him, why would you want to do that? And with that, he walked away. Earlier today, I was actually in one of my narcoleptic situations where I laid myself down after a, a breakfast I fixed for myself, and I was sound asleep, and someone poked me in the arm and then pressed a dollar on my shirt, waking me up. And, of course, I'm in the middle of REM. I'm in the middle of coming to, and I'm not sure what that woman expected from me, but... There would have been other ways that she could have placed a dollar on my cart and nobody would have ever known it. Instead of having to wake me up. You see, people are immoral. And if they want to do something kind and loving, then they should gently wake you up, not poke at you in the arm like you're some sort of animal. And openly, that's that. I'm not offended by the gift, but I am saddened by the fact that she couldn't recognize that I was asleep and that I had rights to be asleep and I had rights to not be pestered like that. You see, there are people that just want to monkey with people. And when you think about it, you sometimes want to say to them, if this was your home, if this little space on the planet was your spot in a chair, and you had fallen asleep, would you want a total stranger to do that? And openly, of course, it made me sort of panic. What did she take? What am I missing? Because sometimes people do that. They play the financial abuse game. I'm going to steal this, and then I feel guilty, so I'm going to be a dollar for this thing. It probably cost a hell of a lot more than that. And that's not okay by me. I've also had plenty of women, Catholic and other, who have thought they had the right to abuse me like that. That if they gave me financial money, then, then they could slip near me while I'm sleeping and cut my beard off. And it's not okay by me. At no time has anyone had the permission or consent of mine to touch me in the night, to touch my body at all, or to cut off my beard. But that is what law enforcement men and women do. They pass around ill will. They pass around gossip about you. And they ruin our rights to our own bodies. Politicians are doing that marvelously across the land. Well, here's the most interesting thing. If a woman says that she has been raped or molested, everybody's up in arms. But if a man says something about this concept of privacy of human dignity and privacy or propriety, men laugh and women can't believe it. Isn't that offensive that there seems to be a, what do they call it, a double-edged sword about these things? We teach our children in educational schools and educational programs and classrooms not to touch one another. And of course, by the time they get to junior high, everybody's touching everybody, whether it's appropriate or not, and having a good time with them, usually lovey-dovey in a way. 
but then we mature ourselves into the prospect of adult living and careers and what we discover is that people are sort of ill well earlier today I was trying to make myself up a uh, handicap uh, ramp because the marvelous people doing the roof has cut off two handicap ramps in front of the shops I needed to shop at so I had to go in a different direction. I had to do something different. I had to go up a different ramp, which is hard to get up because it's just not successful for a person who's elderly, a person with a rollator, to get on top of it easily. And some woman came along and started to call me Boo and wanted to know if she could help me. And I'm just like, who the fuck are you? Do not call me Boo. I am not your Boo, and I'm not your black child, so don't you fucking call me Boo. That's the only time I've ever heard that word used. My Boo. My boo can be a child and my boo can be some boyfriend or girlfriend in the black community, but I don't know any white people of my age and station on education that call anybody boo. But this was a white woman clad in some sort of outfit. I didn't even see her face, really. She was you know, rather matronly and uh, older than me, and she was with her, her, either her grandmother or her mother who was pushing a rollator. And it was totally obvious that she got out of her car as just as I was starting to walk down there, which I didn't think was all that marvelous. But the reality was she was trying to take a hold of my car and do things, and I said, no, please. Because I don't need somebody to knock me over, and I don't need somebody to control what I'm trying to do, and I don't need to be in anybody's way. And that's why I was being patient and waiting, because those were ladies, and they had the right to go up and finish their day. And she was so busy fucking around and worrying about me that she wasn't paying any attention to her elderly mother. And I'm like, and I gently said to the, to the elderly woman, this is not really a really handicap accident from the ramp, so please be careful as you go. I didn't want her to get you know, hit the ramp and then get pushed backwards because her rollator couldn't get over that very easily. So then the, the woman who called me Boo, who must have been a daughter or someone to her because of the driver of her, picked up her rollator without really giving her any warning and pulled it across the way. Isn't that marvelous? So everybody has a story, it's true. And earlier today I met a nice guy whose name, unfortunately, I'm not good with names the first time out, who was kind of petering through. And I had been to the Goodwill store a couple weeks ago and picked up a dog chain for a couple of bucks. And God said, buy that, you're gonna give it away. I'm like, okay. So I bought it, it's too bad because it was a good chain. But uh, later, a week or so later, he said, don't worry, you'll have a, be giving that away. So this guy, who's you know clearly a, one of the lower end of the society in town, and you can sort of tell who we are, and he was coming through and he had this marvelous little black mutt who was kind of trailing behind him, but not on a leash. And I just turned him and said, hey man, do you have a leash? And he said, no. And so I said, well, I got one for you. And I gave it to him because God said, give it to him. So I did that. And that was the end of the leash. And, you know, Jesus Christ has a plan for everybody. So we met each other that way. He asked me if I had any cigarettes. And I said, no, I didn't. But I could probably find a lighter for him because I think I ran across one of mine uh, in as I was looking through my things. He said, no, he had a lighter. He didn't need that. And so I just suggested him a few nice people on this trip that might have cigarettes that could help him. And that was that, and that was the end of our conversation. I think we fist bumped and we went on our way. And that's what men do in the streets. But a lot of people don't recognize you have to adjust yourself, you have to change yourself, you have to kind of downgrade yourself sometimes to talk to people. And that's what I try to do, and I just try to give people the grace that they need. But I do what the Lord tells me, regardless of whether he's a good guy for me or a bad guy for me, it didn't matter. He's got a dog who follows him around, so that means he's got to be a pretty good player. But that's all I could say. But I knew that in this community, you have to have a leash for your dog. So I gave him mine. And that's okay, because I can figure out why God was wanting me to buy a leash with a red handle on it anyway. I do not do red. There's a lot of reason for it, but there's a lot of emotionality to it. And openly, that's okay. People don't have the right to know that. My love will eventually understand that. In life, we have moments of time to tell our story, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm telling my story about living in the streets. I'm telling my story for God's glory. And I'm telling the story about how God's prophetic gifts are good to me. He told me early in the day that I'd get my money replaced. And the truth is, the magic of God is each day I spend money and each day it's replaced now. And I'm so thankful for that. And God is saying, don't worry, you'll be able to cover your lovely wife and her children without problems. And I'm so excited for that. I miss her a lot. And in this time, I can let go of my old wife, who is Japanese, and my Japanese son who are no longer with me, and as much as I miss them, as much as I love them, as much as they were a part of my life, as much as they are my Japanese family, still in the spirit realm, I don't have to play into that anymore. I have a new family 
on its way, and I love her every day, and I have for the past 10 years. And that's that. You see, I have some marvelous friends, and I had a really good friend whose name was Karen, and she was a great friend for two months straight until someone like Maria interfered with it, or some marvelous neighbor, or some child, or some husband, and it got ruined. You see, the love of the Lord is between people, and they can be friends without any problems. But the love of God is also someone who says, you know, I think you need something else. And maybe this is right for you. But you didn't think about that. You were too busy wanting to please everybody else but God. And that's a shame because she's the reason I started writing. She's the reason that I made books. And she is one of the reasons that my book is pretty good and not pretty good. Because I needed her to help edit it and I needed her to put her part of the story in it. And I definitely needed her for that. In life we have moments of time to speak the truth about who we love. And I have three women at this time that I'm pretty interested in. One of them knows who she is, one of them has received the marriage proposal multiple times, and one of them threw, and that same person threw me off the porch. But, you know, that's our story, and I'm sticking to it. The second one is also a love of my life because of the ways that she played in my life and the ways that she got helped by me to be a better wife for her husband. But the third one's kind of new to me, and the third one Mama Bear has given it to me to look at, and I'm kind of intrigued by her, but what pisses me off is to find out that she may already have a love. Or, if the new videos are correct because there's no rings on those fingers, so maybe it didn't work out for her. And maybe there's a possibility there. But it's this time in life that men have to make a decision because I'm 50. And I have the right to go into the next 20 plus years of my life with the right girl and the right wife. And nobody's going to tell me I can't. You're never going to fucking tell me who I can love. And if I don't include you in who I love, that's on you. It means you're not in what we call the circle of trust in that ridiculous, stupid movie with Ben Stiller and his beautiful wife and that stupid ass actor who played an asshole hunt, the father and grandfather De Niro not one of my favorite films but my children liked it so I tolerated it and that's what you do when you're a father in life we have moments of time to speak the truth and the truth is that I have loved a handful of women all through my life and I'm never going to stop doing that and you're never going to tell me that I'm not man enough to do that because the one thing I say to every fucking player is what have you done in your life? What did you do for your family? What did you do for a wife? How long were you married? How, what did you do for a child? How long did you say, serve them? How long did you care for them? How long did you pay for them? What did you do in your community? How many business people did you serve? How many people did you talk to? How many people did you network with? How many things did you do as a man? And until you can prove to me that you've done more than me, then don't even act like you're a man to me. In life, we have moments of time to establish our judgment and our discernment. That is not some sort of horrible judgment. That is the truth. If you're a little boy who's still in college, and they call you a little boy, that while you may be lawfully a man, you're still living on your mommy's and daddy's time. So don't make fun of me, because the minute they pull that plug, you're out of time. And you're homeless, like me. But I'm homeless because people stole my rights. And that's on them, not on me. So I'm a man in struggle, possibly. Because every day I have to put myself forward and have conversations. But I don't like to be played with by a Catholic nation. I don't need to be played with by a Muslim nation. And I certainly don't need to be played with by the little Mexican mafia man who runs a garbage truck and can barely do his job. In life we have moments of time to speak the truth. And the truth is the truth that's within me, not the truth that's within you. Go do your truth in your way and I'll do my truth in my way. But right now I'm waiting to meet a woman who might be a good employer or who might just be a good friend and her name is Evie. And Mama Bear taught me to look for her, so I did. And I'm kind of impressed. She's kind of my kind of girl despite the fact she's a Capricorn. I won't hold it against her. But don't you fucking tell me I can't love an Aquarius and I can't love a Leo and I can't love... What the fuck was she in Japanese? A rabbit. <laughs> Which is totally opposed to me. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'm Blake Henson, and this is not the Mark in the Minutes anymore. This is a storyline with Priest.